Please consider supporting Black Women United, YEG, for the protection and advancement of black women and girls in Alberta. You can learn more about them at bwunited.ca. They are always looking for donations and volunteers. So please, again, support Black Women United, YEG, for the protection and advancement of black women and girls in Alberta. Again, that website is bwunited.ca. Hey, this is Trevor from Halifax calling in to say that I support creative control on Patreon because I think long-form arts journalism is a crucial part of music culture and there's simply not enough of it out there today. Vish is a master interviewer, he lands great guests, and he has his finger on the pulse of the ever-changing music landscape both here in Canada and abroad. For all of these reasons and many more, I think you should support Creative Control on Patreon too. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. I'm Bisha's wife, and I will love him no matter what you do. And now he has me on the record saying that. Adam Sturgeon is a musician, songwriter, and community organizer who is currently based in London, Ontario. His band Whoopso recently released a stirring rock record called Warrior Down, and as we speak, it was just longlisted for Canada's Polaris Music Prize, an annual award where critics select the country's album of the year. Warrior Down is available via You've Changed Records, and Adam and I recently had a conversation about how he almost followed in his father's footsteps to play hockey in the NHL, what being coached by Don Cherry was like, how he has processed his family's history with Canadian residential schools and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police murdering his cousin, Jerry, why his personal experience as an aid worker leads him to support calls to defund the police, his thoughts on Canada's National Indigenous History Month and National Indigenous Peoples Day celebrations, his own future plans, and more. A part of the Entertainment One Network with the support of listeners like you who follow and subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it and make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash creative control and Massey Hall's concert film series live at masseyhall.com where you can stream dozens of 30-minute films for free including performances by past podcast guests like London, Ontario's own Shad, plus in-kind support from Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton. This is the 547th episode of Creative Control, featuring the thoughtful Adam Sturgeon of Whoopso, with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Hey Adam, how's it going? I'm pretty good. How are you? I'm not bad. I'm not bad. It's I'm good. You know what? I like to say I'm doing very well because in the grand scheme of things I feel like I'm doing very well. Would you say you're doing very well? Yeah, I I I think so in that context for sure. Yeah. That's that's how I'm feeling. Uh where in the world are you today? I'm in London, Ontario. And we we the last time you were on the show you talked a little bit about this, but how long have you been in London again? I guess it's the longest I've been anywhere now. Uh, it's like 10 years. 10 years. And, and what brought you to London? Well, initially to, to uh, I guess, to go to school. The band started in, in Guelph and, and Kirsten, uh, my co-founder, 
uh, was from Guelph, so she was going to Althaus to become a teacher. And then I was also looking at uh, different types of uh, social worker programs. So we landed on uh, a few different cities, but uh, my my ancestors are from the London area, so that one kind of took the cake. So we, we moved this way. Hmm. Now, I, uh, you and I knew each other in our Guelph days. Uh, I miss Guelph a little bit, only in that I feel like I miss normalcy as much as I miss... Guelph was when things were normal for me, and then I moved. <laughs> we moved, and then everything became abnormal. I mean, when you move to a new city, everything is a little abnormal, but obviously the world... Uh, has changed a lot since around the time we moved. Um, do you miss Guelph per se? Oh yeah, I mean, we're we're all over the place all the time, and uh, especially when you drive into Ontario from the east, there's this like vacuous feeling, this looming, f- high-paced negative energy that sucks you in, <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> Guelph is like the one spot in the all of the, all of the southern region of the province anyways where I'm like oh this is calm this is peaceful uh and I felt the same way before I moved to Guelph I mean I grew up going to Guelph as like my culture space my family's from just outside of Guelph in uh, Erin mm-hmm. or uh, Erin some people call it um it is pronounced, so Guelph it, it is it like, is pronounced it, Erin I think isn't it yeah, it is. <laughs> None of us say that, though. I, I have always said it. As soon as someone told me how it was meant to be said, because I used to have yeah. to go to Erin. I worked uh, when I was uh, in between uh, schooling there. I worked at a car rental place, and one of their satellite locations was in Erin. And I always pronounced it Erin, because that's what it looks like. It looks like the name Erin. Mm-hmm. But someone was like, no, it's Erin. Yeah. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. You really went all in on that first letter. All right, I'll go with you on that. Then Erin, I call it Erin. So Erin, Ontario, is a little rural community, about uh, what twenty five minutes away from Guelph. Yeah, yeah. So I, I like, I, I always had planned on, you know, sort of settling in in Guelph when I was sort of traveling as a as a young person. My former life was as a hockey player, so I was already kind of living around, touring around a bunch, and. Uh, Guelph just always stood out as that like beautiful space. I mean, it's changed a lot, a lot, a lot, but it's still nice. Yeah, I had the same experience growing up in Cambridge, Ontario. We would go to Guelph to see uh, concerts and there was a couple of of record stores. But yeah, that the fact that there was cultural stuff going on uh, and, and, you know, similarly, um, Cambridge is a big city. It's not it's much bigger than Erin, but. Uh, we just didn't have the same kind of cultural stuff going on. So Guelph is special uh, in that regard. Uh, you say you, your former life as a hockey player. How serious were you playing hockey? Uh, I, I did play professionally. Uh, I got hurt, and I probably would have kept playing. I presumably may maybe still would be playing. I'm kind of relieved I'm not. Um, there are a lot of things like when I, when I stopped playing, I was, I was done. I think a lot of what's going on in the world right now can, can point to, um, uh, just like a poor culture, poor forms of leadership. And that was like really prevalent in hockey less. So the, the further up the ranks you go in some instances, but then at the same time you end up with these very, very large personalities. You say, you say you played professionally i didn't i don't know exactly what that what that means you played for the los <laughs> angeles kings or something who did you play for professionally uh, i played mainly for a team called the flint generals so it's more like slap shot oh. you know just like gooning it up but uh i don't know i guess my claim to fame would be like i did i did go to some nhl camps and played some exhibition games and whatnot but uh i kind of got hurt before my career really took off so that it's kind of too bad, but uh, again, uh, it's also not something that I super regret. Either. No, I mean, you mean because of the, well, there's various reasons probably. The, obviously, the CTE stuff, the injury stuff, uh, the whole culture seems mm-hmm. uh, problematic. It, it, the more we learn about hockey players, I mean, I guess it's not a surprise to those of us who have grown up among hockey players that they might be... I don't know, narrow-minded in some regards. I I hate to paint uh, all hockey players with such a broad brush, but 
is that what you're referring to? Like the culture oh. or, or was it the, was it yeah, the injury yeah, stuff? To, to, well, both. I mean, my, my dad, uh, you can't diagnose CTE, but we're fairly certain that my dad does have that. And for the last four years, I've been experiencing um, these symptoms that sort of feel like vertigo. But basically, all all things kind of point to the fact that I've been knocked out a few times, you know? On the and ice. So, yeah. We even have a song called CTE that'll be coming out uh, actually this fall. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a hockey song. So I'll send that your way. Um, well, I'd, I'd like to, I'd like to hear, I do, I play hockey or I was playing kind of, uh, I, I played minor hockey up until my parents said it didn't seem safe. Uh, so up until around, uh, what happened there? Oh, we went to India in 1989. And so because we were going from November to January, they're like, no, it makes no sense for you to play hockey this year. I would have been 12. Right. And then that was the last time I played in a, a league. So yeah, roughly around 1989, 1990 was the last time I played uh, in, in a minor hockey league. And then in the early 2000s, there's this arts league that was an initially spearheaded by Exclaim magazine. They started this uh, Exclaim sort of arts hockey league. And so yeah. it was fun. You'd play with like um, people from the Sadies and Sloan. And uh, I feel like Alex Lyson from Rush would hang out at the arena. And it was just <laughs> really super fun. And it was no contact. It was called, I think it ended up being called the Good Times hockey league of the arts so you discover all these i would make friends and all these musicians uh, both uh, established and fledgling would play in this league and it it just rekindled my joy for the actual sport like i like hockey i don't like mm-hmm. all of the physical stuff with it i don't like the brutishness that goes on but the actual mm-hmm. you know chasing the puck around with the stick and and the ice and like the, the you got to wear all this stuff. I kind of I like that. Do you have a, a love of the game on in that regard still, despite your experiences that were uh, at least negative or and, and it, it sounds like they've harmed. And by the way, I didn't even follow up uh, on this. Uh, your father played hockey. Is that why you mentioned the CTE? Yeah, my dad played uh, nine years pro. He was drafted in the second round to the Boston Bruins. <laughs> Holy cow! And, uh, yeah, he had a really. Um, coming from where my dad came from it's like just the hugest accomplishment and hockey is like such a part of our our family so for me it started at a really really young age and so I didn't even I I was so competitive that I didn't even really have much of a a social life and uh, it took me a long long time to even learn how to uh, socialize I think after the after the fact in a in that sort of non-competitive way. I don't, I don't really know how to describe that. It just took me a long time to readjust after my hockey career. <laughs> Interesting. What, what's your dad's name? His name's Peter. You can go on the hockey DB. You'll find it. Peter Sturgeon. That's right. And so what years did he play? Uh, it was like in the Boston Bruins heydays. So I think his draft year was like 71 or 72. Whoa. So did he, yeah. he played with like, did he play with Orr and stuff? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was a really hard lineup for him to to crack, and and most people will just find this super interesting. But my dad and I are probably the only father and son to ever play for Don Cherry. Oh, you played for Cherry. Yeah. So I I like know what uh, that uh, we can go right to the source of that hockey culture uh, <laughs> the issues. stereotype. Really, you know. He coached yeah. you at the Flint uh, in the Flint team. N- no, in the OHL, I played for the Mississauga Ice Dogs briefly. Oh, and and yeah. oh wow, okay, now, this is remarkable. What 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 was he? <laughs> get to that. Let's let's get to that. What was he like as a coach? Why do you say that he maybe exemplifies uh, negative aspects of hockey culture? I think those of us who follow hockey in Canada and have followed uh, Don Cherry's trajectory, which is now on, uh, as he well he was um, he was let go uh, from his perch for mm-hmm. comments he made recently. Uh, and so what would you want to say about Don Cherry, uh, in that regard? Well, I want to be careful not to like oversplain him or anything like that. And, and and by no means defending that any of the things that he has said, because we know that those things are wrong. Yeah. But there's something about the way that, um, we perpetuate our identities in the media that sometimes are 
not the same thing as uh, when the lights turn off or whatever, when the when the cameras stop running. And so he was good to everybody. Um, he wasn't there a lot of the time. <laughs> he was only there. He was like a part time coach, which was weird. Oh, okay. Um, but he wore he wore hammer pants, and he had on all of his funny branded equipment and all of those things. He w- he was kind to all the players um, from all walks of life. At that point, uh, at that point, that we our team was uh, multinational or whatever. Uh, there were Ukrainians and Russians and uh, people of color and all those mm-hmm. things. On that end, on that end, though, <clears throat> like I do not look like a native guy, and um, so often the dressing rooms were just full of just the worst type of language, and uh, you know that that didn't help my situation either. Um, so I, by no means would I defend on Cherry. I just, it's like, as someone who actually has met him or whatever, like I, I did see that other side of him. And and I in life, I just like want to like open people's minds like Don Cherry to be like, I was wrong. Like I said some really stupid shit that I don't think I understood or meant, but maybe he means those things. Yeah. So, you know, I... So he's got to he's got to go too, right? Like it's over. Yeah. Well, he seems to be. He started a, a podcast, and <laughs> I, I don't know what happened with that. If it's still going, but uh, yeah, that. Um, I mean, I uh, in the last few years, I was trying to play uh, pickup games in Guelph at uh, Exhibition Arena. They had these late night games. I was trying to prepare for the annual Exclaim tournament, so I would go and play a few times. But I had a hard time with it. It wasn't the good times hockey league of the arts with, you know kind of culturally sensitive people. I was playing with weekend warrior guys and it was mostly stuff about women. I mean, I would get, I always forget sometimes, uh, that I'm a POC and that, um, I, I, during the pandemic, I've been wearing masks and gloves, uh, to the grocery store. And when I was first doing it, not everyone was doing it, but I was doing it and I would get these looks and I would think, oh, well, initially I'm like well it's because I'm wearing the mask and the gloves and then I thought about it I'm like no these are familiar looks <laughs> I am in western Canada and people are alright nice in my history here I mean I've been coming here once a year since I met my wife in 2001 and I haven't gotten it's a multicultural city in a lot of ways I like Edmonton Edmonton's cool I like it but I was starting to get the look uh, with the mask on that I grew to recognize as the look I get often just wandering around the world. And Mm. so, um, yeah, I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't play those weekend warrior games because of just, just the commentary. Like, I don't know if I'm just being too sensitive, but the stuff about women in particular, it was, was getting to me. What do you, from your perspective as a guy who, uh, plays, uh, I would say, uh, very emotive, and sensitive music and you're immersed in an underground culture that I think is steep in, in those feelings as well. What is your perspective on why when dudes get together to play sports, something happens to their brains when <sighs> they start talking about women and people who are different than them in a way I can't, I don't really have, we all kind of just are like, yeah, you know, hockey players in the dressing room, they're going to be, they'll get a chatting, but what, do you have any perspective on what is it? What's going on in the psychology of a group of young men who have been bred to play hockey that it makes them say and do, uh, you know, often horrible, if at the very uh, best you could say questionable, but there are enough stories to suggest that it's often very horrific and disrespectful sort of behavior and commentary. What, do you have any sense of where that comes from in terms of sports and why it maybe gets people thinking and talking a certain way? Yeah, I believe really strongly that behaviors are learned. Um, you know, racism is learned. Uh, prejudice is learned. So I keep coming back to blaming leadership um, I've heard that like adrenaline is poisonous. And so mm-hmm. I, I don't know how that affects our health. Like when we're exercising or whatever, you know, like when I'm doing jumping jacks, how like 
I'm coursing poison through my veins. It doesn't make sense to me. You know, it's like, it's a healthy thing. Yeah. I was in really good shape and, and all those things, but maybe it's like the ego that came out when I got really strong and buff or something like that. But I, I, I think it comes down to leadership. And I mean, that's what we're seeing in, in so many walks of life right now is that our, our leadership has sort of preconceived biases or, or whatever. And, and I guess there's like a, a mob mentality that if, I don't know, you know, when I was playing hockey, I was between 16 and 20. So I was super, super young and, and sexed up and, and whatever. And like, those feelings are natural, but, but then in a, in a large grouping, maybe they just like, you know, comp compound or whatever, I guess. Do you know what I mean? I, I do know what you mean. And I will take this a step further in suggesting and tell me what you make of this. I'm interested in your perspective. There are enough historical accounts about the sort of dawn, if you will, the dawning of racism and prejudice and and genocide frankly yeah. that are steeped in competition um basically Whoa. there are so many cases that you read about where particularly in the civil rights movement in the 60s um you know there are stories about lynch mobs appearing when the rumor or the uh, incident involved uh, a white woman becoming interested in a black man or a black right. boy or a man is accused of whistle, whistling at a white woman. And yep. and so I think weirdly, when I think you said mob mentality, and I think of lynch mobs as obviously succumbing to this horrible base mob mentality, and I feel like it's almost... Within that envy and anger and jealousy, it's competition. It's a mob trying to outdo what they view as an opposing mob. What do you make of that? Mm. I th I think that 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 makes a, a lot of sense. I mean, we are in a in Canada a super watered down mob state. Yeah, you yeah. know, like that's that's what this is here. It's like so watered down and mild that we've like, we've normalized all aspects of prejudice within this country. So, I mean, I think that we live that every day. And for, for those of us that, um, that have to be visible that way, I mean, I'm not visible that way, but I was raised to be a different way. And, um, so my experience is, you know, a, a bit unique, but I don't think that it actually is because I think that the direction of, um, you know, for, ex for example, we have the Indian Act, but what we're going to have is we're going to have all these acts and treaties, but we're going to have no status Indians left through the process of genocide and discrimination against women. So our country is founded on the dismantling of a matriarchal society. So all through the, this conversation I just keep thinking about like what the what the the male role and so for yeah. for a lot of the teachings I have here it's this teaching of loti sclo legete which translates to seed carrier right which is like mm -hmm, very mm -hmm. genderized and I and I don't like fully identify I I fully identify with that for myself as a masculine person but that doesn't mean that I can't be in touch with my emotions that doesn't mean that I I can't allow um, my partner to be to be uh, autonomous in our household. That doesn't mean that um, that I can't stop and listen to other people when they have something to say. Yeah. But but there is something in the power. I think you know the power of physicality, the power of the mob, of or of the the whole, the greater whole, or whatever that all these things that we have learned have, have been told to us and no one ever thought to question them. Well, you talk about power, and um, I think the quest for power is steeped in insecurity. So when you're talking about men trying to, you know, hold women down, and, uh, and in the case of white men, hold 
basically every other, you know, POC down so that they can thrive, so the white man can thrive in this case. I think that's there too. When you talk about power dynamics and uh, attempts to kind of denigrate and hold the matriarchy back, I think it, it maybe stems back to the competition thing. I think it's just in a... We are very polarized in everything we do now. And so everything has become uh, right versus left, uh, skin tone versus skin tone, ethnicity versus ethnicity. Everything has... And we're just, you know, America has has uh, made a, a game show host their, their president. Yeah. Um, and every show that started out as I'm going to teach you how to cook a cake or bake a cake I'm going to teach you how to build a house all of these DIY impulses have now taken on a competitive aspect um, we are just I my kids were watching one the other day uh, some show about sugar on Netflix for kids <laughs> I can't remember it may be called sugar showdown or something I don't know what it what, it, what it's called but sums up there uh, and it's really a it's an insecurity thing. We're just constantly being bombarded with competition. And I feel like that might be swimming around what we're talking about. What do you think? Yeah, I, I think I agree. And, you know, I, I think that we're on a wave of awareness, but we're also on a sort of a wave of um, different waves of colonization. And the one right now happens to be technological. And we've been able to hide behind that that veil the screen to um perpetuate some of these uh negative values and i i don't know why we we do that i mean yeah. i have a toddler at home and um this toddler pushes pushes the boundaries and like has behaviors that it's like whoa like where did you how did you pick that up like where so there's something natural to and I mean, there's um, when you when you say that maybe this is something we I think you were alluding to the fact that we're kind of steep in this. I mean, what is nationalism? What is sort of, um, you know, segregating people, uh, placing people in residential schools? That's holding people down in general for the conquest of land. Um, and so if you're kind of born into like, this is my country, that's your country. Uh, this is our land. That's your land. If that's what you're kind of born into then you you mentioned earlier that, you know racism is learned behavior but i i'm starting to now that we've been talking like i think that kind of competitive juice that flows within us whether we're playing hockey uh whether we're brandishing a flag for our country uh or a uniform of some kind i mean that is a that is kind of a designation uh, a separation of ourselves from others and i feel like we've all just this is how we tend to live if we don't think about it too much. Like, I'm Canadian, you're this, uh, I'm not going to... We won, that's why I'm Canadian. You know, we we conquered a people uh, that were here, and uh, I don't know, do you, that's all there, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I, th I think so. I think so. It's It's funny, though, because, I mean... I, my dad built me a backyard rink in the backyard and I loved it, you know? And like when I dream about hockey or when I think about hockey, I think about that like sort of freedom or whatever, but some of those things come with it. Like the, yeah, the, the, the desire to be the, the best or something like that, rather yeah. than to stand in a, stand in a circle and put my mind together with other people's. So I've really worked on, I've really worked on that personally you know I prioritized that in my life and I don't think that I'm perfect at that or anything like that but it's been a huge focus on making a dramatic shift in my in my behaviors I guess you know yeah I don't yeah. think that I've I don't think that I've been like the best person in the world or anything I also don't think I've been the most terrible but I've <laughs> focused on I've focused on uh trying trying to be the most inclusive that I can mm -hmm. that's fair there is yeah. an inherent uh, competition within imperialism and capitalism, I guess is what I'm getting at. Right. And, and I think that's, you say, we, you know, we are all conditioned to be our best. And on some level, to be our best is uh, how we measure up against others. 
Um, right. It's interesting. Well, I'm, I think. Well, well, that makes me think about the potlatch, which was which was banned in Canada, right? And in, in I think it was 1951, and and the premise of the potlatch was the the chief in the community that gives away the most is the richest, the the most uh, revered, and there's still a pride in that, you know. Um, but it was it was about uh, taking care of others. So yeah, maybe those same those same behaviors could be nuanced into a positive way. I mean, in a as a band, I like. I'm a mental health worker and in a band and as a mental health worker, all the work I do is to destigmatize the particular circumstances of the people I'm working with. Mm. And in art, so often I feel like everything we do is sell those same stigmas and it's it, like, it, it feels really unhealthy. And I think I participated in creating like a, a musical identity for myself or whatever, you know, or like, and then and then over the years it's like well wait a second i have to actually like change this uh mindset and try to um do something with this art to contribute to a community to contribute to awareness or whatever yeah um and then then you get then you get labeled as something as well right like political or uh righteous or i don't i don't know how we're perceived entirely. I'm it's, actually really confused about it. I mean, what, what is more competitive than politics? It's weird. I think that the whole thing is set up. We're just kind of set up to be, uh, live our best lives amongst each other, but kind of view each other as competitors, competitors in, in terms of the loved ones. We, we are able to, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, partner with, uh, we've all, we've all heard about that competition over a relationship, you know, competition mm-hmm. for a job um did you ever you know you've started a record label out of sound records and uh you play in a band do your competitive juices ever flare up in uh, those realms like yeah con- constant <laughs> <laughs> i mean less so now for out of sound out of sound um has not like we never we've never changed really much of what we've done maybe we've like gone to the internet a little bit more but it's always been sort of like a diy thing and so it's it's pretty easy going there but maybe i'm like a little bit more complacent about that these days or i i've compartmentalized uh, that portion of my creative output um and you know we try to share that space as much as we can um yeah and and with the band you know I don't know. It's hard. Like some of the content on our most recent record was like really, really intense for me. And I was very, it, the album was done for a while. Record labels were interested and we took some meetings and, you know, like that weird stuff. And then all the rejection that came with it and the confusion, but also anger because I felt as though the things that were represented here were 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 either being ignored or misunderstood or um just too complicated for a music industry executive or whatever to get behind Mm -hmm. and that really that really got to me for a while um and then and then we landed with you've changed which was basically our dream label and uh obviously uh steve is the one of the like most modest humble people that I've met in this Mm -hmm. world. And, um, so he's just like a great, uh, he's like my, my musical sage at this point. (laughs) You had mentioned that, um, when we were talking about your dad and, and and his background, you, you'd sort of alluded to the fact that, uh, his background was a difficult one. Um, on the cover of, this album that you've been describing, the album is called Warrior Down. And I, I would like to give you a belated congratulations on this record. Um, uh, I hope it sounds like you're very proud of it. And it also uh, messed you up in good ways and bad ways, maybe is a way to, way to put it. Um, your grandfather's on the uh, cover of this record. He uh, was in the military and he was a residential school survivor in Canada uh, and you also, as I say, you mentioned your your father's difficulty um, 
in terms of his background before making it uh, to the NHL. Do you want to talk about those things? Do you want to talk about your grandfather and your father and what you were alluding to there in terms of uh, hardships and, and, and how that's informed you and your path? Yeah, I, I mean, I can do that. Um, it's a whole can of worms, I suppose. But um, I mean, a lot of people are becoming aware of those issues, right? Like starting with the residential schools when when someone is taken away from their family and never sees their parents again or their parents drink themselves to death, as in the case of my grandfather, within months of losing their children, um, culture is stripped of you. And that's that's more than cultural genocide to me, um, though uh, my grandfather did live. But um, the reason why he's in that military attire on the cover is because when they were kids in those schools, the queen came to visit and uh, the government decided to go to First Nations and uh, pave the roads and put in some municipal powers to make them seem like they were nicer than they were. Mm-hmm. And and they brought all the, all the school children to the airport and uh, lined them up as the queen came off the plane. And they all had new clothes for the day, um, only to be taken away, you know, as soon as they returned back to their sort of prison camp so my grandfather saw these soldiers guarding the queen and he thought that that's what he should do the the most praise that I've heard in my family stories of him getting as a young person was that as a little uh, slave laborer which is kind of what those schools were agricultural labor camps in many instances um he he plowed a straight line as like a five or six year old with a donkey, you know, mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. like what what he was told was good. And so he didn't know what it was like to be a father or to have a father. And so that perpetuated itself and through the regimentation of the military to my father, who was born in the in uh, in the Yukon and. Uh, was you know basically a like a military base kid, so traveling all over, uh, all over the world um, until uh, until my family landed in Brampton of all places. Bram- Brampton, and dad, Brampton, Ontario, which is just outside of Toronto. Yeah. I guess. yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then and then his his challenge, but he happened to be like a really great hockey player, and I mean, and his father, in in his defense, did the best that he could right Mm -hmm. but the types of things that take place are are not good and I haven't been able to share everything about this stuff and as uh as the the grandchild of a uh full status Anishinaabe person who is in total denial of that aspect of himself, it would be very easily for me to be assimilated. However, we still have our last name, Sturgeon, which uh, is a pretty common name in this area that I live, London area. Mm -hmm. And, um, and because my dad grew up as a, as a half breed, he was, you know, kind of like beat up, abused and tormented and, he had some different um, learning challenges because of alcoholism, because of abuse, and and he and he's and he's an amazing, accomplished person at this point who is you know finally able to live a sober life. I'm jumping all over the place. It's it's so hard to talk about. So for me, like I'm two generations on, and I have a I have a better situation than my grandfather did. And so when we started this band or when I went to school to learn about more about this stuff, and then when I started, you know, getting my uh, quote unquote traditional teachings as well, I, I really focused on the idea that I needed to uh, make sure that I was able to share the privileges that I've experienced to, to make sure that I raise up, you know, indigenous voices as best I can. Yeah. And I try to navigate that, you know, sensitively. Um, and as a musician, I, I do feel like I take up space sometimes. But 
um, I also don't really think that there's a lot of um, records like Warrior Down out there. And uh, so I I have to believe in in that and in myself. So growing up in in Brampton and Erin, living in Guelph, with all of this swimming around within you, all of this knowledge of your family history, uh, what it meant in terms of uh, institutional uh, corruption, and corruption is putting it lightly, institutional crimes, uh, all of this is swimming uh, in within you. What was your life like? You found hockey, um, so you had that to occupy uh, your 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 mind and your and your soul on some level. At some point, you found music, but again, this trauma that your family endured was within you. How did you? How well were you able to deal with this? Did you just simply? You, you know, you mentioned I, I had a better life than my grandfather did. Um, how much of that trauma was informing your everyday life uh, growing up in southern Ontario? Well, my life growing up was a little bit dichotomous. So there were some pretty serious binge drinking experiences that as a young person were very confusing and traumatizing to see your parent basically killing themselves, not acting themselves and, and being, you know, uh, violent or, um, whatever. So that stuff was really hard. And then the other half of the time it was, it was total sobriety, right? It was just full on or full off. So there was this sort of militarized regimentation. And so hockey made some sense. And, uh, the way that I dealt with it was, was by fighting people taking my aggression out on other people that had nothing to do with the circumstance. I mean, in sports, like I don't, I don't mind like the odd fisty cuff. I think it keeps things kind of honest on the ice or whatever, but, um, but psychologically for me inside myself. And I think for a lot of other athletes, potentially anyone that wants to cause harm is like, that is poison. That adrenaline that you feel when you are fighting with someone else is totally poisonous (laughs) <laughs> but that's how I dealt with it. You, you, you dealt with I it on, is, got you know, on the ice or did you get in fights outside of uh, hockey? I mean, mainly, mainly on the ice, but I mean, those things revealed themselves from time to time in other ways, right? right? right. Um, in, the, in the schoolyard or, or whatever. But um, no, I, I, I did, I did have an, an easier go. I mean, it's hard to compare trauma. We should never really do that, but you know, I, I, I recognized that my parents loved me and did the best that they could and that there were just some addiction issues that were holding us back as mm-hmm. a family. And I'm happy to say that, that those, um, that those things aren't present anymore, but now we have to deal with the ramifications of health, um, from, from those years of abuse. Right. So it's all still there and it's all a product of the system that was you know placed against indigenous people that's the way that i believe that's the way i look at this circumstance yeah. there are many powerful songs on warrior down um that i have experienced live um uh, as well before they this record came out jerry comes to mind uh, long braided hair uh, comes to mind jerry in particular has always stuck out in the set um it's a very powerful song it's a powerful narrative. What do you want to say about Jerry? Where did that song come from? Well, my my cousin Jerry was um, murdered <laughs> murdered by an RCMP officer by, um, to my understanding, a like a rookie cop who was um, dispatched to Jerry's house after a complaint was filed against him. Uh, at a, I think he was at a bar and he threatened his friend and, um, this cop was dispatched to his house and we don't really know what happened from there. Mm. Uh, as we, and this was in Saskatchewan who have a very, very complicated relationship with, with police in Regina and, and legislation therein. This, the, 
you know, very same region that Colton Bushi was murdered in. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so they just have like a a terrible system of abusing people in need. And Jerry needed some help. And, uh, you know, that's like, it's not, it's not all so cut and dry. It's not like Jerry was perfect or anything like that, but that doesn't even matter. Right. Like he needed help and support. And, and my family was, we were the only people to love and help Jerry. Yeah. And that's really upsetting. Um, I just like went, I was just, I'm in COVID. So I was deleting all my emails and I came across all my emails from Jerry. And it's like, I had one from three weeks before he died. Yeah. It's just like, so crazy that, um, yeah, I guess you're trained to shoot to kill or whatever. I right, like, I don't, I, I don't know why we don't have a like more proper system in place. So, I, th- I mean, I think that the song is super relevant, but like uh, outlets like the CBC turned down playing the song. You know, Pitchfork didn't pick it up or whatever. Um, and these things like sort of tore at me a little bit or whatever. I was really afraid of what was coming when we put out the record. Oh, (laughs) I was really scared of, well, I was really scared of how people would perceive, um, mixed identity in Canada. I was afraid of how people would perceive, um, and respond to, to some of the ideas of the song. I think people recognize that, um, I know that people like the song Jerry, but you know, as we were getting ready to put out the record and it like, wasn't, getting the love it was the it was the music listeners that um brought that song to life so yeah. like our fans and um the true music media which there are really great music journalists in Canada of course um but it was not the the music industry or the whatever that was behind that stuff and that really i was really worried of how that would make me feel mm-hmm. because it 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 was such a intense song to write you know well, i mean cops and authorities play a role throughout warrior down i mentioned long braided hair that is ostensibly a story about cops as well isn't it well i mean i think that it could be i i don't think that <laughs> that song's kind of like two songs in one mm-hmm. one 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 part of the song was just like a really intense phone call that Kirsten and I had one time after the breakfast program was closed, uh, in the Northern community that we had been working Mm in and the, the children were, were starting to like really like misbehave in the school and class and the teachers were all out of whack and they didn't know what was going on. And Kirsten was just like, they're starving. (laughs) It's, it's not funny. I'm laughing because it's upsetting. Um, but, the kids are starving like they don't have uh food the food the food is like super expensive and uh they don't have access to it and uh this this breakfast program was like a safe place for those kids to come and like get the day off in the right way and that was that was gone and so i was thinking about our young people and whenever i think of young people i do think of mothers (laughs) and so um that's where the sort of missing and murdered indigenous women theme ties in, um, which is of course, um, related to, uh, police. Yeah, that's right. Well. That's what I was getting at. And I, I, I maybe yeah. went too direct. I appreciate your contextualizing it, but you know, as you and I are, you, yeah. as you and I are speaking, uh, America, the United States of America has exploded in, um, in riots, or rather, in, in rather in uh, protests, they're calling them riots. They're not really. I don't think. Well, I think they're riots because of the police, frankly. Uh, in protest against <laughs> the police, um, it's it's having efficacy. Um, from our Canadian perspectives, what do you make of that in relation to a song like Jerry, uh, Long Braided Hair? We have a police issue here. We've had it for some time. Uh, you mentioned Saskatchewan, uh, which is in Canada known as a place where indigenous people are murdered, killed by police, left to die 
driven out into the outskirts, uh, these sorts of things. Um, when you see what's going on in America, what do you think about in terms of what's going on in Canada and what should be happening? I mean, I think that the police state is the police state, kind of no matter where you look at it. I th- I mean, I'm an advocate for um, defunding the police. Um, as a person who uh, has worked um, on the street at, at street level, um, working to support people uh, experiencing street level um, crises and, and uh, street level circumstances, I've, I've had lots of interactions with the police and I'm happy to say that a lot of those experiences have been positive. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that I'm a good advocate for for the defunding of police because I've seen when they can do good things. And it comes in London. It's come from our, our beat. So like our, our foot patrol, the leadership that has worked there and the way that they've understood street level circumstances in our community. So it's a community based approach that has worked better. I mean, you're going to talk to someone else who, who has had negative experiences in the same capacity. So I don't want to be naive to that. I just want to say that I have seen the police help people in a good way yeah. in people that are vulnerable and that, um, have been adversarial, have been high, have been violent, have been all the stereotypes that you could ever shake a stick at. Um, I've also called the police and had car cops roll up, be super hyper rude to me when I've called them to ask for help or they had a direct line to me, vice versa, and toss people around. Toss people around for not wanting to be bothered Hmm. for, you know, no reason. And so through my job, I kind of learned and slowly the organization I was working for just basically became narcs. So I left. Um, But... De- defunding the police will doesn't mean the abolishment of police and I feel like people should know this by now but I yeah. guess maybe maybe mainstream media isn't talking about this I don't know but what we're talking about is reallocating funds for uh, better support services for all people yeah and until until we can until we can take care of uh, until everyone can be in the room if the room is not accessible for everyone to be in then the the space is not fully realized. So the same could be said for the our systemic approaches to housing, to income, rehabilitation, right? Our prison system. It, is this uh, a is this a is this weirdly a marketing issue? Like defund the police sounds like a knee jerk, uh, overarching action. When what you're saying is what I think it means. It's basically redistributing the money that they get because they're not getting the job done of protecting people, f- protecting people from themselves in some cases. Um, and, and their power, you say like, you kind of hinted at the bad apples argument when you said, <laughs> I've had police come and be amazing. I've had some come and push people around. There is that bad apples thing that's been floating. This, this isn't all of them, but that's not how you affect change when there are there's such a pattern of behavior among a cohort of people you need to get at the root of it so i guess i i'm with you on this i feel like the defunding thing i don't know everything is such a soundbite slogan thing now right you have to like yeah headline society soundbite society read the headline Yeah. yeah and they're not they're not digging in deeper and i think that that goes back to like our complacency it's like learn about the fucking issues yeah you know, teach them in school and in comedy and, and make people think in comedy there's something called the rules of th- the rule of threes and so you say things uh in a kind of a grouping of threes and i find it interesting that that's a lot of what the kind of contemporary sloganeering is become like black lives matter defund the police this sort of threes thing keeps i'm not saying this is comedic in any way I just think I I do know that that's a that's a common thing in comedy the rule of threes. So I just think that um, that is if you forget that it's comedy, you could say that's a common uh, rule of communi- communication um, that maybe we process thing in threes. So I do I do think it's funny that not funny. I think it's interesting that 
somewhere along the lines we settle on these phrases. And I feel like defund the police is the nuance of it to me is because I've read more about it. And what you just said is exactly what I think it is. But I think some people Mm -hmm. just hear it. When you just hear that phrase, it sounds um, perhaps simplistically antagonistic, right? For some people, you can't just abolish. That's what people hear. Abolish the police. It, 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 that's what they hear instead of what it actually is saying. So anyway, this is not, we're not doing a focus group on uh, <laughs> how to make this a more effective message, but I, I feel like we're, we're on the same page uh, on it. And uh, I agree with you, I guess is what I'm getting at. Um, as we're speaking, it's, it's June of 2020. Uh, June in Canada is National Indigenous History Month. And June 21st, I believe is, National Indigenous History Day. Is that correct? I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. What do those things mean to you as, in terms of institutionally uh, mandated uh, commemorations? Do they mean anything in, to you to you in particular? Um, well, I'll use the example of um, maybe you've heard uh, or read. I get, you're in Edmonton, so maybe you haven't heard this yet, but there's some uh, argument to change the street of uh, the street names, like Dundas Street, change that because yes. that was uh, yeah, a I, slave owner. And, yeah. and I, I agree with that. It goes, it goes into language, and language is so, so important. Over the num- last few years, you know, I, I've stopped using the hockey language and I've redirected my language and focused my language to help me adapt my behaviors and, um, and to, and to show more respect, uh, and, and to, and to end, uh, stereotyping too, I think within my language. Um, that said, indigenous people were always oral being oral allowed you to, uh, move and shape stories according to circumstances so the same the same old story could be told for for all sorts of different things and 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 changed for that so the way that i sort of see these um these marketing campaigns these um these change your name things i i think that i think that they're they're well-intentioned but they're also loaded because we can do we can we can create all the signage that we want but until we do the work it's not going to happen so we have a dundas street in london and it's the same street and they're gonna maybe change the name of that street but i still live in london ontario that's still a colonial concept they changed the name of the river which was like the home place of my people yeah right yeah and and none of those things change. None of the behaviors change. But maybe it's a step in the right direction. So I think that it helps build awareness and it brings more people in. Like we have to do a better job of calling people in, but it's very frustrating to do that. It's incredibly frustrating to call people in. Well, not not to be crass about it, but changing a name like that isn't maybe for us uh, living in this contemporary time. I think it's in a weird way, mm-hmm. it might be the most effective future advertising. That was the crass part. I don't want to call it advertising. But if you change a name of something, as the mayor in Washington, D.C. recently changed the name of uh, the uh, street that leads into the White House as, to Black Lives Matter Plaza, I believe mm-hmm. is what it was called. And so on the one hand, you think, well, this is a an interesting bit of theater and it's it seems to be very um, contemporary in terms of um, it's a contemporary reaction to what's going on. But in 50 years, if that street is called Black Lives Matter Plaza, it's a, it's, a, it's instantly historical, I guess is my point. So you change the name mm-hmm. of Dundas Street in Toronto and London to something else that is more reflective or respective of... Um, your ancestors or the ancestral history of that place, um, I think that's going to resonate. So it is weird to think of it now as having any efficacy. Mm -hmm. But do you see where I'm coming from? Yeah, I do. And I mean, I think that, I think that that, that's the point. And I, and I, 
I do agree with that. I just think that we have to think even more critically about uh, the lens of decolonization. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. Right. And I just don't think that people are quite there. And I guess these are the tempered waters. Sometimes I, 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 I like to talk about, um, yeah, some of these things, some of these issues, uh, issues of appropriation, maybe a sports team or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. not, not mm -hmm. like the Washington Redskins, which are blatantly racist or Eskimos, but you know, like a lot, a lot of my crew wear Chicago Blackhawks jerseys, right. And love it. And there's a different Jersey that they could easily implement and change. And I think that like they probably will at some point. But sometimes I like to think of those issues as like the issues of the crust, you know, and you have to like break into the pie or you have to break through the the surface of the earth to start getting into the deeper issues and getting into the core or the fire yeah. of those issues. And until those are um, addressed, right? So our our colonization has been legal and legislative and administrative, all these ways in which they have clamped down on land, clamped down on people and identity um, and, and technology and medical being uh, also forms of colonization. All of those things need to be uh, worked and dismantled like at the source. So for my family to jump back to um, like my father and my grandfather, like we've had to go to the core of, of our issues. And I don't really talk about the core of my personal issue. Um, mm. I don't do that out of respect for other people, mm -hmm. but I have people that I can talk to about that and, and that made me look at, like helped me, helped me make myself look at that yeah. so that I could turn my life around. Right. Um, right. Yeah. I don't, I don't think, I don't think I'd be like a, a, a murderer, or a, like a criminal or something like that, but I might, I might, I might've killed myself. And, hmm. and so until we go to the core of the issues and, and what I was saying was, was the dismantling of our matriarchal societies so until we address the the uh, missing and murdered women, until we uh, go to those places, I don't think that Canadian society will do anything. You, you feel like I don't these think there will be anything. Yeah, these it's a total failure. These commemorations are superficial at best. That's the way that I feel. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. You had mentioned that in the fall, uh, there may be a new song coming out by whoopso called CTE. So um, this leads me to ask about your future plans. Uh, Warrior Down has been out uh, since uh, November of 2019, I believe. Where is the band and where are you and the band at in terms of uh, future work, works, uh, new material? Uh, can you talk about that? Yeah. Well, we've been doing a lot of stuff for Warrior Down still. Like, as I said, it was kind of a long time coming. So uh, through the pandemic, we did the remixes, which uh, have just come out. So you can you can find those online, Bandcamp, or they're streaming now as well. Mm -hmm. And and worked with some really cool collaborators like Ice Cream. And I think that, uh, like, I love that song, Fed Up. I think that that's like my theme song right now. Ice Cream is, uh, ice cream is incredible. I had them on the show. Uh, in the fall, I guess, when that record came out. And uh, I love that album so much. Um, Me too. Yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah, so we were able to work with some others. Um, it was, it's been really uh, hard. Uh, my partner's still working. Uh, our daycare is closed. So mm -hmm. I've really been enjoying just being a parent. And, you know, we tour all the time. So it, it's been a realization. Like, I've been able to to watch Oda um grow up a little bit more in front of my eyes and I like I wouldn't trade that in for uh, the hundred shows that we've canceled already mm -hmm. I mean it was supposed to be a big year but um, you know we accept things for what they are uh, we we've dug back into our archive so uh, next up is like all the the demos and the seven inch versions of songs that are on Warrior Warrior Down oh, okay cool um, so I'm gonna put those out on the next band camp day We've been raising some funds for this organization called Lifespin. So they do uh, community food boxes for um, low-income families, single mothers, uh, elders, 
things like that. Um, and so uh, we've, we've been putting all that, all that money uh, towards that. So we're going to continue to do that through till the end of the sort of uh, warrior down cycle, I think. And then in September, it looks like we have a little EP that uh, we recorded uh, in Mexico. Uh, and uh, that's coming out on You've Changed and uh, The Grizzlar, which is an Edmonton label. Oh, well, that's weird. That just came up on my show. I had uh, Cass from Wares was talking about The Grizzlar. Also an amazing band. And what a thoughtful speaker. Just, I loved listening to that interview. Oh, thank you. Do, 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 do you know Cass well? Yeah, we know each other. We've we've known each other for, you know, through through music for a couple of years. But uh, yeah, we're like, uh, we got each other's backs, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, Cass seems great. I enjoyed that talk too. I learned a lot about Edmonton, which I need to do. Uh, so that was, that was helpful. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm driving into, uh, like Wonderland when I go down that road off the highway. You know? Yeah. Like yeah. Is it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm, it feels like I'm driving to a theme park. Y- yeah. It has a theme park vibe. That's for sure. Yeah. I, I would say that when you first get in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, or like it starts out industrial and then kind of goes to a theme. Park I think you're vibe. thinking of the arch that gets you kind of into downtown or, or not downtown, <laughs> yeah. but like into uh, like sort of White Avenue area. There's like an archway yeah, that so. sort of says welcome. And you're I think I know what you mean. I think that's what you're referring yeah. to, maybe. I think so. <laughs> and if I was a if I knew the streets better, I could tell you what street that was. But I don't know the name of it right now because uh, I yeah. was just getting used to figuring things out. And then obviously we've been in a stasis here like i haven't been able to really drive around and figure out the city so yeah it has been yeah. has been interesting well it sounds like you're you're busy um can you uh if people want to learn more about was it called life spin is that what you called that is that what it's called yeah life spin life spin.org okay yeah so if people want to support life spin they can go to life spin.org um your records or rather, Warrior Down, anyway, is out on You've Changed. So people can go to you'vechangedrecords.com maybe to learn more about that and uh, maybe the, the Whoopso band camp. Is there anywhere else you want to direct people in terms of learning more about you and your band? Yeah. Um, we have a website called thenoisymountain.com. Um, it's it's really cool. It's uh, The website is up now and you can like stream our records or whatever. But um, we've been developing this uh, hide-and-seek archive. And, um, oh. it's sort of, it's a, it's a collage map. And as you scroll over it, you can sort of find some hidden links and it'll let you explore our back catalog. And it kind of, we put out a lot of stuff and, and, uh, sometimes it's hard to weed through. So we kind of point people to some of the, to the key areas or whatever. It gives like a nice little overview and it's, it's a fun interactive website. So, uh, that'll be, that'll be launching pretty soon too. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Adam, if there's a song from Warrior Down that we can play for people to uh, go out on, uh, what would that song be? Could you pick one for us? Uh, yeah. Um, let's go with Long Braided Hair. Long Braided Hair. We talked about this uh, earlier. Is there anything else you want to say about it? Well, it was just your, when you were talking about um, the theory of threes or or the, what was it called again? It's the, the called the rule of threes. The rule of the rule of threes is is the same in our in our society. So the braid of our hair is supposed to be our connection to the earth, and that's why we don't cut our hair. Um, and the braid as represents the three aspects of self: the mind, the body, and soul. And it's suggested in our culture that unless you're you're using those three aspects of yourself to to think and process what's going on around you that you, uh, well, the, the idea is to do that and to live in a good way mm. to, mm. to live the, to live the good life. So the, the mind, the body and soul, and we have a medicine that represents that, which, uh, most people know as sweet grass, right. but, uh, in our language, it's, it's hair of the earth, wean gush. So, okay. That's, uh, that's also what that means to me. Okay. All right, this is Long Braided Hair uh, by Whoopso from their excellent uh, and latest album, Warrior Down. Uh, Adam, thank you so much for being back on the show and for this time, and I I wish you the best of luck with everything going forward. Uh, Yeah, thanks so much, Fish. Uh, Good luck in Edmonton.
Very special thanks again to Adam Sturgeon of Whoopso for being on this, the 547th episode of Creative Control, which is part of the Entertainment One Podcast Network and is available on all Apple and Google platforms and lots of other stuff too. Do you like Spotify? It's on Spotify, for example, and YouTube sometimes. Most of the things are on episodes are on YouTube. If you can't find an episode that you're looking for, if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my regularly scheduled newsletter, Semi, semi-regularly semi scheduled please visit my website vishkana.com you can like Creative Control on Facebook follow the show on Twitter at vishcreative or follow me directly at vishkana you can also visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation to keep this podcast going uh, as always uh, well I shouldn't say as always you may have never heard me say this before there's a $6 or more tier now which gets you exclusive uh, content access to exclusive content that uh, no one else uh, can hear so uh, you know if you're if you're thinking of going to patreon.com slash creative control uh, consider signing up for the six dollar a month tier and that means you are supporting the show which is nice and uh, the, you know the, the show generally and then you're also getting some uh, extra content so there you go patreon.com slash creative control Thanks again to live at MasseyHall.com, where you can watch uh, beautifully captured concerts by uh, great Canadian artists. Also, Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, Planet Bean Coffee, and Granddad's Donuts for their in-kind support for the show. Uh, thanks, as always, to my friend Jim Guthrie for letting me use some music of his on the podcast. You can learn more about Jim and his work at JimGuthrie.org. And last but not least, thank you very much for listening to this episode featuring Adam Sturgeon. I hope you'll check out other episodes if you're unfamiliar with the show. And uh, yeah, subscribe to the show, follow the show, talk to your friends about the show. What do you like about the show? What do you don't like about the show? Don't talk about what you don't like about the show. There's a pandemic. You can't hurt me. Please, just tell me good things. Well, I guess I won't even know what you and your friends are talking about. But try to put nice, warm feelings towards creative control into the air. Why am I telling you what to do? I will talk to you soon. Take care of yourself. Be safe. Bye. Bye. Bye for now. Bye for now is what I was trying to say there. <laughs>